Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's great to see a, a good room full, and I gather there are people downstairs as well, so welcome to those too. Um, this evening, this is the first of my 2016-2017 uh, series of environmental lectures. And this year, I'm going to be exploring the theme, A Bigger Picture, uh, which is looking at some of the global scale challenges that face us, um, how we might think about them, the scope of them, and what might need to be done to take some sort of action about them. Uh, I do want to start, though, by saying uh, that I am most grateful to the Frank Jackson Foundation for supporting my professorship. For those of you who are not aware, the Frank Jackson Foundation funds research in world-leading institutions and also community initiatives uh, internationally, and they, it reflects the interests of Mr. Frank Jackson, who was a, a businessman from Woodridge in Suffolk. And um, I can recommend the website makes an interesting read, actually, if you want to see uh, what they do. So, today I'm going to be setting the scene, actually, by exploring one of the most rapidly developing areas of science that supports our understanding of planetary scale environmental processes. Earth observation from satellites. And what I want to do is to take you, if I can, on a journey from some of the early observations through to some current cutting edge science, and then to reflect on both the opportunities and the challenges for environmental science that are afforded by this type of analysis. Okay. Now, I don't know in the audience who can remember back to 1972. I was very young, I have to say, but uh, some of you were I'm looking around. Some of you weren't alive. I can see that now. But back in 1972, this is one of the images that provided a genuinely new perspective on the Earth. Actually, I just will take a quick straw poll. Who, who remembers these kind of images in 1972? Oh, good, good crowd. Right. Okay, so this, this wasn't actually, this particular one wasn't the first space-based Earth image, but it, this one caught on, and it was, it was taken in, in December uh, 1972 by the Apollo 17 crew as they hurtled towards the moon, and it was actually taken by a, a handheld camera just pointed through the, uh, through the spaceship window. And you can see on it the whole of the Earth and the south polar ice cap and there's a lot of cloud in the southern hemisphere, and all of Africa. And it was, became known as the Blue Marble. Uh, the point about it is that the Earth appears very isolated and very fragile, uh, if you like, like a kind of ship, an isolated ship floating through space. And despite the perilous journey of those astronauts, uh, I think it really served to demonstrate that the Earth's population were actually trapped and there was only one world. Uh, it didn't have an escape hatch, so people were stuck with the planet that they had. Um, it also provided a quite a nice complement to something else that was going on in 1972, which was the United Nations Stockholm Conference. I've put a quote up on there. Um, it was the, the Conference on um, the Human Environment. The human environment, in interestingly, not the environment, but just the human environment. Um, it's taken place in June, and they'd issued the declaration, uh, a declaration about the environment, which had expressed a need for a common outlook and common principles to inspire and guide the peoples of the world in the preservation and enhancement of the human environment. And there was a resonance, because the image shows the whole of Africa there, and no borders are visible, no internal borders are visible. Now, 30 years later, in 2005, much more recently, NASA issued further images, cloud-free images, of the east and west hemispheres of the Earth at what was then, in, in 2005, an amazing resolution. The resolution is about half a kilometre. Now, we'll come back to the issue of resolution in a minute, but then that was... Uh, that was unusual, and it, they called it the Blue Marble, the next generation. I think there must have been some movie around then that, uh, that they were um, feeding from there. And I think some people may not have even noticed the difference from the original image. But actually, there is a very big difference, which is very important in terms of how we look at these images. 
This is, these, these two, are satellite images. They're not photographs. They are actually satellite images whose pixels, little dots, were radioed back from space at different times, selected and stitched together and placed onto a kind of imaginary wire, a spherical wire frame. So this is not something that you could see yourself. You never could see this. This is an artificial artifact. And um, it's another one. there's another one here. Um, they're all precise, but they're, they're artificial. There's a book about this, uh, by an, in, an interesting book about this, by a recent book by someone called Laura Kurgan, whose uh, book is called Close Up at a Distance. And the point is that this distinction between what environmental elements we might in theory see with our eyes, if we had a good vantage point, and what we can actually see with satellite images is something to which I'll return later. Now, this, this image that I've got up here is a much more recent uh, image. It's from NASA's uh, Discover satellite. It sits at something called the Lagrange point, which is um, uh, a point about a million miles away from the Earth, between the Earth and the Sun. It sort of hovers there. And it shows us um, a sequence, or what is available from it now, is a sequence of the a year's cloud patterns on the sunlit side of the Earth. So it's just looking at the sunlit side of the Earth, in theory, you'd be able to see the shadow of the, of, of the satellite on the Earth, but of course it's too small. But it has a massive capability camera on it, a four megapixel capability camera. And the point is that th there's been a huge shift from that handheld camera in that satellite, uh, sorry, in that spaceship zooming towards the moon to something now which can sit a million miles away and can give us these incredibly accurate, precise images very, very frequently. It takes an image every two hours. Okay. Now, it also gives Earth scientists uh, and environmental scientists a unique vantage point for studies of the atmosphere, of climate. It allows, actually, this particular one allows measurement of ozone, dust, cloud heights, vegetation properties, um, hot spots of various sorts, ultraviolet radiation, and all sorts of things. And we'll come back to how that's done in a minute or two. But it's also... I think, a very brief, uh, beautiful image. Now, I want to go back. I want to skip back for a few minutes. Satellite imaging first emerged in the 1960s as a military intelligence tool. I'm almost embarrassed to ask now. So who can remember the 1960s? Good. I've still got some people with me then, all right. Um, there was a device called Tiros-1. It was first put up by the Americans in April, and I'm sure you will all know that the 1960s was the height of the Cold War. Okay. It, allegedly, it was, it was dedicated to imaging cloud patterns across the globe. And, of course, the USSR wasn't far behind in putting up its own satellites, of course. Why they needed to check the weather was to identify appropriate military targets around the globe, and to manage missiles in flight. So the US, um, something called the Corona satellite, for example, collected high-resolution images for military purposes that were classified until very, very recently, um, when they were, they were actually released only by um, Vice President Al Gore, so very, very recently. They, were mainly, they mainly showed targets, and I'll, I'll show you one or two much later on. Then, in 1972, the first real Earth observation satellite was launched. It's called Landsat-1, and it started to generate publicly available low-resolution images. And it took an image every three days. Now, what, what it actually did, it went around the Earth in a polar orbit, whizzing around the Earth, and as the Earth rotated underneath it, it produced tracks of images, one after the other, sequentially, and it came back to where it had be first been every three days or roughly so. Okay, it was in a low, a low orbit with the planet twirling underneath. And that was really the start of a revolution in Earth observation from satellites. Now what happened then will be, I'm sure, familiar to almost everybody in the room. There was a big change in the nature of technology was going on at the same time. So this Earth imaging for environmental and other ostensibly benign purposes was being enabled by all sorts of other things. 
And one of the things, that, the list on here, one of the things was that global positioning satellites, originally for military use, um, starting in 1991, really, but started supporting civilian uses as well. And it hardly seems possible, does it, that we didn't have GPS before the 1991. But we didn't, actually, or at least not uh, at, a, at a definition sufficiently to be useful. Um, so that was one of the things. Then there was the World Wide Web from about 1992. So people could send data and images around the world and to, to each other. And then there was an explosion in desktop computing. Actually, looking at some people in the room, maybe not everybody remembers this, but you know, those, of you that, those of us that do can perhaps remember getting a first desktop computer. They were astonishingly expensive, actually, but we, we got them anyway. Then people started using something called geographic information systems, which was a way of locating things accurately on the, on, the, on the Earth's surface. I'm not going to go into the mathematics of that. It's very complicated and actually rather tedious, but geographic information systems were important. In the later 1990s, some of this imagery and some of the satellite um, sort of command and control structures were privatised. So companies came in with missions to sell imagery. And that helped get access to imagery uh, uh, out and about into the general community. Last but one point on here is that there was a huge growth in data storage capability. Now, if you, you can think about Landsat, the Landsat satellite, zooming around the world over and over again, making these series of images in strips, Every three days it's coming over again. The amount of data that that was generating was absolutely gigantic. And it wasn't really until the later part of the 1990s that people had anywhere to put it that wasn't incredibly expensive. So you needed that storage space. And now we know all about you know, servers all over the world and, and I think is it Sweden or somewhere that has them, uh, such a lot of them because it's cold and, uh, and so on. So huge growth in the capacity to actually keep data. And the last thing that I've got in here is the appearance of Google Earth in 2005. Now, that's a really interesting um, phenomenon, and I'm going to, I will just talk on that for a minute or two. It's, I think, uh, ostensibly anyway, it's a democratising uh, influence. It's allowed almost anybody who has a computer and access to the web to explore the world. Um, it was a product of a private corporation uh, who produced an application that brought together a, a miscellany of satellite imagery from all sorts of different sources, and it now also offers the possibility of rolling back the clock. Um, so it actually has only been around... It, well, it was launched 15 years ago uh, in 2005 as something called Earth Viewer 3D, and that predecessor of Google Earth was developed for the CIA in America, actually. So we're back to that military intelligence um, thing. But it's probably today been downloaded at least a couple of billion times. Uh, the last figure I saw was for 2011, and it said there's a billion downloads of the software. And I'm just wondering if there's anybody here today who hasn't had a look at their house in Google Earth. Is there anybody? Ooh, one. Nobody's going to admit it. Well, do have a look, because it's, it's fun. Um, what we're offered is views like this. So here's where we are today. This is Gresham, and uh, it's a really high-resolution image uh, in the city, in central London. Um, I'm not going to go through all the possibilities of, of Google at the moment, but it offers also 3D views of some areas, not all areas, but some often city areas. And it, you can go into street view, and you can actually sort of walk along city streets and look at the addresses and see people and so on. They were produced from ground shots from a van that went around with a kind of sensor camera on the top photographing. And they're linked back, using those geographic information systems that I talked about, linked back to the satellite image, because they have to be precisely located. Now, most of the Earth's land surface is covered at a resolution of about 15 metres, actually. But some areas are covered uh, in much more detail. So for some reason, 
I have Oxford connections, but Cambridge is one of the areas that, I'm sad to say, has um, more detailed uh, imagery. And you can see there, if you look closely, you can even see the sizes of some of the buildings um, uh, and, um, you know, you can almost see the croquet lawns. You can see the, all the croquet hoops, almost. Um, in order to, uh, to get this 3D coverage, NASA, and it's NASA that developed this, uh, the, the, the imagery, um, they used something called radar tom tomography, and I'm not going to go into the detail of that, but they, um, that was merged with the Landsat imagery as well. And the recent versions of this, there have been lots and lots of versions of it, but the recent versions offer even things like the bathymetry of the sea. Can you see this is Mauna Loa in the Pacific, and you can see the seabed there. Now, that's not all at the same resolution. Um, that one, uh, most of the bathymetry information comes from, um, it ha has only a resolution of about 100 metres. But it's still pretty striking, and it's enough to see the structure of ocean basins. Um, uh, and that information was collected from research vessels. And if you're really smart and you look on the web, you can even get into things like flight simulators, where you can get into an aeroplane and you can fly your way around some of these landscapes as well. Um, and you can roll back time. So here's Gresham in 1945, uh, immediately after the Second World War. And you can probably see, if you look closely, there are areas that have been bombed, or blurry areas, bits of cloud, and so on. Um, so uh, the imagery, of course, the early imagery, such as this, is not nearly as, uh, as accurate. And this is probably, this is not a satellite image, this is a photograph taken by the RAF uh, immediately after the war. Okay, if we look at another example of more typical Google Earth images, these, these ones are taken near Amsterdam. So there's the one at the back there is a, a, a high up. Effectively, we're apparently quite high up. The one there, we're the, the one at the front, we're zooming in. What do you think the colours are? Anybody like to hazard a guess? Yes, but these are real colour images. This is supposedly true colour. So what we're looking at on the ground is that, really. That's not a satellite image. But almost, we can almost go in far enough to see not the individual plants, but we get the sense that we're zooming in and out seamlessly. Okay, and and that's what we're actually looking at on the ground. Now, today there are in fact, there isn't just one, but there are actually about 150 Earth observation satellites radioing their data back to Earth. Now I've just got a few of them on here, um, and it indicates which nations, despite the expense of putting these things up, actually prioritise that kind of technology. And the list is quite an interesting one. India, Russia, Japan, China, France, Brazil, Argentina, Nigeria, and Korea, South Korea, are strong supporters of satellite imagery. The, US, the UK, and I can't help getting a political point here, the UK is currently part of various European consortia. What will happen there, I wonder? Um, however, South Korea is interesting. Um, South Korea has a particularly good system. I'll show you some pictures, uh, some images from it later on. And of course, the drivers for that development continue to be military. Um, ostensibly, South Korea's satellites are supposedly supporting disaster relief. But no doubt, the areas across the border with North Korea ac attract some interest. This is part of North Korea. Anybody like to hazard a guess what that might be? It's a prison camp on the Chinese border. Uh, even has a railway station, which of course has some horrible resonances with, with World War II. Okay, now, um, it, so this one is probably largely for military purposes, but along the way it has picked up some astonishingly good Earth observation information. Now if I just, stick, uh, just switch back to the, um, my diagram showing the uh, this advanced space technology. Uh, I, I sometimes think of these things as a bit like flying dustbins, you know, full of stuff. And they sit in one of several orbits. Now, I've already mentioned polar orbits like Landsat. So you can see there's a, a more or less vertical orbit going over the poles. And that's where Landsat shoots around with the Earth rotating underneath. 
the, uh, the other orbit um, is, uh, uh, is geostationary orbit, which is the yellow one. The other main one is the yellow one, and that's where most of the meteorological satellites sit. And they stay actually completely stationary, more or less. So there's a ring of them around the Earth, looking at the Earth. Um, I will make one point, though. The, in movies, you sometimes see these spy satellites that appear to be able to follow running men, you know, little men running along, and the satellites following them, and somebody in an office somewhere, um, close to here probably, saying, oh, well, he's gone into you know, Charing, uh, Charing Cross Station or whatever. Um, that's completely, as far as I know, it may not be true, as far as I know, that's the realms of fantasy still. Um, they do have solar panels. You can see quite a number of these have solar panels. Uh, but they have to carry fuel to keep themselves from being slowed down by the friction and falling back to Earth. So there isn't any spare fuel to keep, you know, pointing them in different places and zooming in and out at particular things. They, the best they can do is to switch sensors on and off at particular times as they pass over particular areas. But they don't point. Uh, they don't manoeuvre. Unless there's anybody here who can tell us otherwise. Now, let's just switch back to this one. Right. Now, if for the moment we just consider images that appear as we would see them on the ground in terms of their colour, so true, something we can call true colour, there are some very arresting scenes. So here, for example, this is, a, I think, a stunningly beautiful image of an otherwise highly inaccessible area. It's the Chapman Glacier in Antarctica. And you can see its feeder ice caps. You can see its lines of, of moraine, the lines of rock caught up in some of the glaciers. Um, you can see the temporary lakes, um, and you can see the, something about the underlying bedrock. And it's worth saying that this looks like an apparently pristine environment. I can't see anything on there that's obviously touched by human activity. And it is very beautiful. And for an Earth scientist, it's giving you a new view of something that would previously have been very difficult to get at. Now, conversely, of course, some landscapes are complete fantasies. Uh, this, is a, this is a theme park in Colorado. My two sons would love this. Um, it's, um, it, it's LH Gardens theme park. It's created and maintained just for fun. So it's an entirely manufactured landscape, but still visible. And much less fun, but no less a human artefact. We can now see things like refugee camps. This one, is, uh, this one is in Jordan. It's a salutary glimpse, I think, at an un otherwise unfamiliar, at least to those safely here in the UK, place. I think there are a few things we can observe about it. The sharpness of the boundary between which separates those 80,000 Syrians who are migrants inside those boundaries and the contrast between their regimented and um, densely packed camp huts and the more organic and chaotic patterns in the surrounding agricultural areas, also fairly intensively settled actually, are very stark. This is apparently now the fourth largest city in Jordan um, and at one point in 2013 it had about 200,000 people living in it. The environmental impacts of it of course are, are very clear as well. The brightness of the image of the area inside the fence reflects the complete absence of vegetation inside those walls. Its true colour, again, looks like a photograph. And this is a true colour nighttime shot. Um, it's been superimposed onto a map of the American states, but it's showing the United States, as it says, at night, satellite photograph of the USA at night. I, like, I actually like this one better, which is a satellite image of India on the night of Diwali. Again, you can see the colours, in real colours, as they would look if we were personally standing up there in, in space somewhere. Uh, and it shows you the huge impact of human activity on what would otherwise have been a completely dark image. Now, slight digression, there are some pretty funny things on, uh, on, to be seen on Google Earth in particular. I don't know how, whether anybody spotted that one as a sort of giant... I think it might be a woman, actually, I'm not sure. Um, this, you've seen this one, do you know what that is? Somewhere in Italy? It's that, it's a giant rabbit. Um, 
And um, uh, this one's closer to home. You see the super crab? It's at Whitstable. Don't go near the car park at the end there. Um, why is it there? I don't know, but they're on Google Earth. So it's presumably some kind of sandbank and I don't know. Anyway, fun, amusing images. We'll come to another uh, one or two fun ones as well at the end. Now, Earth observation today, that's the background, if you like, it focuses on many different themes. Weather and climate will be very familiar to most people, but things like agriculture, ecosystems and biodiversity, energy, water and disaster management are just some of them. And for simplicity, and a bit tongue-in-cheek, I just grouped a few images into the ancient alchemical clusters of uh, earth, air, fire and water. Um, in each case, I want to ask you to think about the extent of any human influence evident in the image and um, how such images might assist us to manage the environment or to cope with some emerging disaster. In our earthly group, if we start off there, um, we've got striking landscapes such as Iceland's Vatna Jökull ice cap. You can see we've seen an ice cap before. This is, uh, this is an ice cap that covers about 8% uh, of the land area of Iceland at the moment. It's the largest volume of ice in Europe. And Google Earth allows us to look at this as an environmental scientist and immediately have an impression about how the landscape functions. So you can see that what's going on here is, if you like, it's like ice is oozing like a bit of toothpaste being squeezed down those valleys uh, across the land surface and then releasing water, uh, fresh water in, and sediment into streams and into the, into the sea. So we're getting a, what I would call a synoptic view, a high level view of some of the environmental processes going on in that landscape. Again, at this sort of scale, there is perhaps tiny evidence of human activity, but not much. Okay. Now, by contrast, of course, if we... Uh, sorry, and, uh, yeah, just go to the other end of the climatic spectrum. This is um, an area I'm familiar with. This is part of uh, uh, the Sahara, uh, very hot and dry. And in this one, we've got, um, again, we've got star dunes in the photograph, at the, or the image at the back, taken from Google Earth, huge... Uh, wind-blown patterns at a scale and regularity which until these satellites were up was almost incomprehensible because you had to drive across these things in a Land Rover you couldn't or occasionally people would fly across them but you couldn't get high enough to see the patterns so and, and then you can zoom in uh, and this is a the, the superimposed image there is taken from a, a, a much more recent um, satellite GOI-1 uh, a few years ago now. And very sharply defined images, again, which help environmental scientists to understand what's going on. And again, in this case, to think not much evidence of human activity there, I think. Now, conversely, if we look at areas like this, this is a gigantic gold mine in South Dakota in the States, huge hole in the ground uh, cut amongst the forest. It's, it's the human impact that strikes you first. And here's another one, a completely different one. This is Chad, uh, in the middle of Chad, uh, the area of Jemena, I think that's how you pronounce it, the capital of Chad. Uh, and you can see there, what you're looking at mostly is human, the human legacy on that landscape. We can, of course, as I said, with, um, with Google Earth and with other sa satellite images, we can link them through time Again, this helps us to take a perspective on environmental, uh, environmental changes. So this is, if you like, halfway, I talked about earthly images, this is actually halfway between earth and water. It's the Iselmere in the Netherlands, which is um, really, it's a former inlet of the North Sea, the middle of the images, uh, surrounded by land that's been pulled out of the Rhine Delta by human activity and only is kept as land by complex arrangements of pumps and sluices and so on. So it's a human artefact. And what's interesting about this particular image, if I can uh, just point it out, is if you look at the area here, this area here in 2001, this is called Markovard. And then if you look at it again here, it's a different set of images. There was a, a, a 
detailed focus on the Netherlands in the, in the mid noughties and so you see um, the legacy of that in the you can see the edges of some of those images but if you look at that area it, it's reverted from land to being water and here this is the situation today it's actually a shallow lake it's about three between three and five meters deep and what that is actually reflecting is a big change in public attitudes to the environment in the Netherlands they went off the engineering approach and started to favour much more and much softer engineering approaches to environmental management and that's now being managed as, as a nature reserve and it's not intended now to be agricultural as was originally uh, the case uh, back in the uh, before the, uh, the start of this century. So that, again that's telling you something, it's telling you something very obvious and contextualising environmental processes and environmental management. Now, before we move on to the, from the earth to the air images, I want to introduce another, uh, another parameter into this. We've, um, so far, most of the images that we've been looked at, uh, we've looked at, have been something that I called true colour images. They look like photographs. They can be at different levels of resolution. So this, here you can see one of the pyramids and the picture that's superimposed is a more recent um, image, with, although I've reproduced it um, smaller, it's, it's, it has a, a 0.5 metre resolution, so it, it can see things at half a metre. Actually, in practice, it can see things smaller than that as well, but uh, ostensibly it has a half metre resolution. They look like the photographs that we might take with a camera if we were above the earth, like... Um, uh, as I said, uh, yes, just like a camera, as if we were floating in space ourselves. But just as, in fact, these digital images are not photographs, they are made up of many separate images draped over a spherical wire frame, an imaginary spherical wire frame. They're also made up of digital signals that come from different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. Now, this is where... I'm going to try and simplify the technology pretty dramatically here. The, the electromagnetic spectrum is far too complex an issue to cover in a, a one-hour lecture. So I'm not going to try and do that. It's, what we see as visible light is a very small part of a much broader spectrum. So here... Whoops, let's go back. Here you can see, here's the visible spectrum, that... Um, rainbow of colours. That's the bit that we see, the bit of the electromagnetic spe spectrum that we see with our eyes. So, um, different parts of the spectrum, you can see there, range from gamma rays and X-rays, which are harmful to health, and they have very short wavelengths, actually, very energy intensive. And then at the other end, if we move from the left to the right in the image, we've got things like um, microwaves and for cooking and radio waves at various lengths. Now, the, the point here is that the bit that we see with our eyes is just that little bit in the middle. And we can also, we can carve this spectrum up into sections, which are called bands. So we could just take the visible spectrum and we could say, well, let's carve it up into red, yellow and green or something like that and just look at the red radiation or just look at the green radiation. And that's how satellite sensors are designed. So up in one of those Landsat images, there, I think there were originally four or five bands that were being sensed. Three of them were in the colour range, and the, other, uh, the others were actually into the infrared. So what, um, what happens here is if you then take those images, you can combine the signals in each of the bands together in different ways. So if you think about um, your, if you've got a printer at home, a colour printer on your computer, you have to replace the cartridges, if you like me, innumerable times. So you're forever buying, what is it, cyan, magenta and yellow and black cartridges. Okay, now, each, if we took uh, an image using several different sensors of the same part of the Earth, and then let's suppose it was yellow, magenta and cyan, and then we mixed them together and displayed them in those original colours, that would, that would look like a photograph. 
Yeah, and that's what we call a true colour image. That's like the ones that Google Earth uses. But actually, we can combine them together in different ways. So we could take, perhaps, say, two visible bands, let's say um, uh, yellow and magenta, and one infrared band, and, and display those on the screen together. Now, you might say, well, how, how on earth does that work? Let, if you look at these images here, the black and white one at the back is actually some, a research area of mine. I, I, it's still eye-watering how much those cost. They were bought in the 1980s. They came as photographs, black and white photographs, and you had to cut them with scissors and stick them together uh, so that you could navigate across bits of the Sahara Desert. Um, but what that image is, it's an image only of infrared radiation. So it's just, go back to that image there, it's just an image of something in this range over here. So the sensor was just looking down, just recording reflection, or let's say radiation, from the surfaces of the Earth, the Earth just in that one band. OK, now the important thing about um, infrared radiation is that, or well, the defining characteristic of it is that water absorbs radiation, infrared radiation. So when you get dark patches, there's very little infrared radiation being detected because it's been it's the sunlight that's falling on the Earth, the rays of sunlight falling on the Earth in that original range are just being absorbed by the water. So nothing comes back. So you get black. So this is an area of southern Tunisia. I'm a, originally a hydrologist. And it tells me, this black and white image tells me where the water is much more effectively than the other image here, which is a true colour image produced by Google more recently. This one's much better on resolution, but it's not as useful to me as a scientist. OK, now, of course, with minor variations, you can use this system of sensing different bands and combining them in different ways um, in, it, in almost any permutation. There are some systems in satellites that actually generate their own signals. Um, these ones are mostly uh, actually dealing with sunlight, but uh, you'll all know about radar, for example. So some satellites actually send out an active radar signal and detect that coming back. Okay, but these ones, these ones here are just, um, these are passive systems just recording what is um, being generated by the surface. Okay, so the point is we can mix and match these bands to see different things. And if we look at this, this is the Nile Delta. I'm sure you recognise the, the shape. In a true colour Google image. So it's green, they're the palm trees and what have you, um, and the river. Now, if you wanted to reflect it in false colour, you might, for example, reflect the infrared band or the absence of it in red. Okay, now it's not that the river is running red, but you might take that dark, those dark patches that you can see from the satellite where the infrared radiation is low, and you might represent them on the image as red, and you get that. Now, this is a false colour image of the Nile, and you can see immediately that for somebody interested in water, it is very easy to see in this situation where the water is. Now, let me give you a, a, another example. Here's one. This is in Saudi Arabia, and you can see exactly what's going on here. Um, this is human, uh, human impact on the environment at a vast scale. Water is being pumped up in the centre of each of those little circles and is being used to irrigate the area around it with big rotating spray things. OK, so the false colour, this is called false colour imagery, false colour infrared, this one, it's very common convention that the infrared range is depicted in red. Okay? It is just a convention. Now, there are all sorts of other ways of mixing and matching, and I'll just show you a few others here. So here's one. This is in Canada. And again, they've taken different, um, uh, different bands. I don't even know what, which the bands are on here. But it's been designed to show the areas of ice and water in blue and the vegetation in yellows and orange tones. So again, they've taken three, or, uh, three bands, three different bands, merged them together, displayed in different colours, and this is what you see. And you can see there where uh, there was a giant meteorite collision uh, over there many millions of years ago. 
Okay, um, yeah, here's another one. This is uh, in California. It, it, the bands are a different selection of bands displayed in different colours, but you can see here the, I think somewhere down there, the San Andreas Fault cutting through, through there, and you can see uh, various um, aspects of the agriculture in, in California as well. Um, this one, uh, this is actually the area near where I live in the English Midlands, and I, I can't even actually remember what the bands are, but I put it up to show you that now you can have different bands and you can have the change in time, and the colours are not true colours, they are false colours, and what we're looking at here, this set of images was designed to, to show you the change in this area, these areas that are in pink here, which is some particular crop that's being grown in greater and greater proportions. Um, so they've been put together, mix and match, different bands in different colours to show you what we want to see. Now, that's Earth. We're going to speed up here. Air, in my alchemy, uh, you'll all be familiar with images like this. These are familiar from uh, UK and international weather forecasts. And the main advantage is, of satellites is the frequency of the coverage and the ability to see immediately what's happening to clouds at different scales in real time. So this is a typhoon uh, in Taiwan um, and you can start to represent them in different ways. Well, what um, the images here, I'm not going to talk about the one on the right which is to do with wind speeds, but the one on the left is actually de detecting cloud height using an active um, sensor. But it's mixed together with uh, a visual passive sensor in the middle image. And we now, not only can we do that, but we can start to combine them and see them in real time. So this is, this is just uh, last week. This is Hurricane Matthew um, hitting the coast of Florida. So now you can start to see the data processing capacity, the huge amount of data that we have torn out of the sky, processed very, very quickly and reflected in images and then linked them together. So the processing power of the computer, the storage capacity that's increased so dramatically, has become very, very important. Um, this one, this is um, a really cutting-edge science one. This is some work that's being done in the University in Oxford. It's actually about dust generation in Africa. And this is um, the, what they call the convective cause of clouds of dust in Saharan areas. And the, I won't go into what all the different colours are, but the satellite is looking at what they call optical aerosol thicknesses. And it's looking at bubbles of air throwing up dust into the atmosphere in, in, uh, in Africa. And some of it eventually, in some cases, arrives, of course, with us. You find it on your car sometimes. Um, and it's come all the way from Africa. OK. Um, so what's... Um, yeah. There's another one here, which is actually Rio, j just before the Olympics. And somebody was trying to highlight the fact that actually there was an awful lot of air pollution uh, above where the Olympics was going to be. Um, and uh, most of that was dust, and that's a, that was a sort of dust-related image. Um, right, so that's, that's um, air. Uh, let's go to fire. Um, again, here we've got pictures of... Uh, the S uh, Soberanes fire, which is, I think, still going in California. Um, the huge drought in California. You can see there the smoke coming from the fires. And uh, there's a, a, another one here with the smoke's going in a different direction. Uh, th these ones are back in August. As I say, I'm not sure whether it's, it's gone out yet. But these, clearly, these kind of images give you huge potential for managing this situation because you can see not only where the fire is based from space, almost instantaneously now, but you can see where new fires are starting out, uh, and you can perhaps move in and try and stop them. Um, this one I love, and again, this is cutting-edge science. This is volcanic fire. And um, two, the two short images, the one on the left there is an ash plumes coming from volcanic activity in Indonesia. So you can see on the left there, the, um, the, the source of the volcano, and it's throwing up an ash cloud, which, of course, is very dangerous for aeroplanes. But I find, what I find more um, challenging and more interesting is the one on the right, which is the generation of sulphur dioxide that can also now be detected from satellites. So 
It's, again, it's taking particular bands. It's reflecting the concentrations on a map, processing the image very, very quickly, linking them together in time. Now, you have to get to do this kind of thing. You've actually got, at one point in time at least, to take some samples to check what you're seeing, what it means on the ground. And that would be the subject of another lecture. But the point is that we can now do this. And I think that image there showing you that this um, sulfur dioxide goes you know, out across the Pacific and back in towards Australia um, is, uh, is an interesting one. It is, of course, toxic. Um, but it also is part of the circulation of elements in the Earth. Sulfur is an important environmental element. I talked briefly about... Oh, sorry, one more fire. You can see the aurora borealis from the various satellite images, actually, in either in black and white images or uh, in colour. That one on the right from the International Space Station. Okay, um, now I talked about water before, but I will just return to that because I want to show you some more complex pictures. This is a, a very typical um, Google Earth picture. It's a, I think it's the Mississippi Basin somewhere. And the water, what you can see here is the, the main river full of sediment. You can see where the front of the sediment is reached about here as it's flowing down, the, presumably flowing left to right in this image. And you can see fossil courses of the river here. If you look, you can see them all over the place over here, fossil courses of rivers from thousands of years ago. Um, that's a standard Landsat image, which again, we would never have been able to see this until, not, not in this way, until very recently. We get images like this. You know where this is? The it's the Dead Sea. Um, so we can all, it is possible, I haven't got an image of this, but it is possible actually to detect salinity variations in water from satellites in space by choosing the bands that you look at very carefully. Um, so that's, that's uh, again, a, a simple uh, true colour, apparently true colour. It's not true, of course. It's an artefact made up of these different bands stitched together. But when you get to something like this, this is a very recently generated image. It's a, actually a mixture of radar and other things. It's the Aral Sea in Central Asia. The remaining bit of the Aral Sea is over here. And the image is a mixture. I haven't put the key on because it's very complicated. But it includes different colours showing you when the water was there uh, and what, what the soil is like as it's been left behind, as the lake has shrunk, as the water has been used for irrigating cotton fields. So what we're left with now is a very nasty, polluted lake. Um, there's an equally nasty one in the States, I have to say, called the Salton Sea, if anybody's been down to that direction, uh, which only in the 1930s was the site of performances by major stars. It was a big lake, and now it's all been used up. Um, so, uh, icebergs breaking up in real time at amazing resolution as well. Uh, the resolution now that we can get is anything down to about 30 centimetres, which is, you know, astonishing. Uh, I can't remember what this one is. Um, oh, um, this is about climate change. This is um, Greenland's northeast coast, and again, it's recording changes in sea ice. It's been classified. I haven't put the key up because uh, it's complicated. But and we can see algal blooms in the Baltic. Um, again, we're just looking here at the green uh, and blue reflectance bands. Can you see the boat coming down there? Um, again, a bird's eye view, a synoptic view, we would never be able to see before. And here's water temperatures in uh, Lake Michigan. You can see on the left-hand side, on the west side of the lake, a, an area of cold water bubbling up uh, from underneath. And then we see classic images like that. The reason for me showing you this is that in watery domains, um, we are realising amazing potential. Um, the, this one is uh, an image of uh, uh, showing you a future technology related to the monitoring of illegal fishing. So you can see the ships. That's a fallen one, but uh, you can see the ships. You can monitor the marine reserve areas in real time, and you can send people out to, to pick up, or you will be able to when this is finished, uh, in real time um, to, to intervene. 
there's one more here. Yeah, so it comes at a price. It's pretty expensive. And uh, I show you here that the resolution here, older satellites were around 10 metres. Now we're down to less than one metre resolution. So different satellites, we're moving up that diagram. And the frequency of the observations that are made is also changing. So we're moving from left to right, generally, um, across the diagram. And it just positions different satellites. Uh, and it shows you how much they cost as well, how much does a, uh, a, how many dollars per square kilometre does it cost? The brown ones there, the GOI uh, and SkySat and so on, sh cost about $25 per square kilometre. But some of the others now are getting very cheap indeed. There's some there, five cents uh, a square kilometre. So it's very, very cheap. Now, I want to emphasise that most of this is very benign. What we're talking about here is environmental science and the improvements this makes to environmental science. All very positive. We can get information about soil erosion, plant disease spreads, fertiliser applications, climate change and so on. But we are left with some issues about who's looking at what and why and how the images are represented. So at what point does illegal fishing, for example, or the one I would site which is closer to home is we can now see cows being taken backwards and forwards across the Irish border between the north and the south because they can claim subsidies both sides of the border. Now, you have to admire the invention, don't you? At what point does that kind of observation become an infringement of one's civil liberty? Google Earth has certainly been, um, not been without its critics. Now, military bases can be, now be seen by anybody. This one's an interesting one. This is, uh, I think, this one's in China. Um, or it, it's a Chinese base on a, a reef called Miss Chief Reef. And I'll just, you can see there, I think there is a sort of enlargement, what there is down here, you see, on this thing. If you look at the next, there's an adjacent reef, which I, the image is also posted up by CSIS. And uh, there's some planes, but look at what it says at the side. The aircraft in the above satellite image were added for illustrative purposes. Now, I wonder who was trying to give the impression, even if it says that they're there, that, you know, that's, um, uh, that's what's going on there. Actually, those planes don't exist. Um, so data can be represented in ways which are misleading. I don't want to comment too much on this one because the imagery has never been released, but it's the image that Colin Powell um, presented about Iraq before the uh, Iraq war. Satellite image purporting to show stuff that had come out of interpretation that perhaps didn't exist. Okay? Uh, I, this is taken from book because the images are not available um, uh, now, uh, certainly not on the web. Um, and... Um, of course, there are issues about areas being censored. Uh, I showed you images of North Korea. They're not censored, but North Korea doesn't allow North Koreans to look at imagery. And for many years, actually, bits of Cheltenham, because I used to live in Cheltenham, and I kept wondering in my naivety, why can't I see this in the same level of definition as I can see bits of Warwickshire? And of course, then after a while, it, I twigged that it's because GCHQ, which you now can see, is there. OK, so in the UK, Critics have argued that Google Earth is an invasion of people's right to, join their, to enjoy their own property without being observed, um, and that um, I think it would be true to say that the state's right to secrecy and the individual's right to privacy are very much contested. Um, Google Earth fought back, actually, at some of this, and they, they used to have... They're very funny company. They used, when you originally load Google Earth, it used to be that when you loaded it up, the image you saw on your screen centred on Area 51, which is a, a classified US military base. Um, and uh, I found that rather amusing. In fact, uh, you know, we could go into a lot more detail. You can see that now, so you can see everything, in fact. And it's been de they've given up declassifying uh, it, but only very recently, actually. And in fact, the Russians were selling imagery of it on the commercial marketplace. But not everybody likes this. So here's an, you can see this man here. This is Google Earth, in, this is north of the border. Uh, this man who doesn't like being photographed. And I'm, I'm just, I was hesitant about whether to show you this next one, but 
I like this one. This is a, an independent boys' school uh, in Stockton on Tees. If you look closely at the roof, you can see, I assume it was the kids, but it might have been the staff, I suppose. Um, it's gone. It's been replaced by a nice white painted rectangle, which is where what you'll find if you look now. So not everybody likes this intrusion. Not everybody sees this technology as benign. Um, some people clearly think of it like this. Big Brother is watching you. Uh, concerns about creeping totalitarianism, I suppose. Particularly, perhaps, but not exclusively, because much of the imaging image processing capacity is now in the private sector. And um, people start to say, well, the environmental police, for example, should there be such a thing, could put some of this imagery to uses that we've not even begun to imagine. Now, I'm going to leave you with a benign image, which is a really nice image. It's a very high resolution image. It's those wildebeest crossing Kenya. Can you see them? We can now see not the cows crossing uh, the Irish border, but the, uh, the wildebeest migrating across Kenya, as viewed from thousands of kilometres away. Thank you very much. <laughs>